the theme of entrepreneurship is all about doing things others have not done, going in areas where you might uh, love what you're doing, but there's no guarantee of success. In fact, you learn often from setbacks and failure. Chelsea Handler is known as a unique comedian, but she's about to embark on something there's no guarantee of success, doing things very differently. And uh, we're going to uh, discuss that in a few minutes. But before that, if you could just uh, share with us your early life. You were one of six, youngest of six children, Jewish father, Mormon mother, and, and a gap. Not a hard choice <laughs> to make. <laughs> and the death of your older brother in a mountain climbing accident changed the dynamic of the family, changed the way uh, your, the atmosphere you grew up in. Could you describe that and how that led to where you are today? Well, thank you for starting with something light. Um, <laughs> when I start bawling in two minutes. Uh, I think it changes the dynamic in the way that you see your father. My father's a big, strong man. Like, you know, he's a big physically, big mentally, big everything. And you see that kind of wreckage to have somebody pulled out of your life. It's much different. I saw my mother die eight years ago over a period of six months, and I was trying to help her die. She was like, please help me. Let's, let's, and it's such a different experience than somebody being pulled out of your life with no warning. You know, one day everything's fine. You have six kids. You think you're the Brady Bunch, a poorer version of the Brady Bunch, but a Brady Bunch nonetheless. And all of a sudden, you're not six. You're five. You're not, like, that's all you think about. I was 10. But to see what my parents, how they fell apart and the deleterious effect that it had on my father, even more so than my mom, because my mom was a little bit more spiritual and a little bit more like we've got other kids. My dad, seeing him kind of lose it in a way, I don't think he ever recovered, but I would hear them in the morning crying in their bedroom, you know, just it was his oldest son and it was just a terrible accident and, and, it, and he bl wanted to blame everybody, he wanted to sue anybody that was on the mountain because they might be responsible and, and, and it, there was a definite, you know, there are six kids, everybody's dealing with their own grief and everybody, and nobody can help each other because we all don't know what the hell happened. Some were at college, I was home and you kind of had to pick up the pieces and deflect and I think for me, I was always trying to be like, I'm over here, like, hello. You can't just have me and forget that I'm the youngest after you had five kids and I'm a big accident. I'm over here. <laughs> and then when my brother died, I felt like I'm gonna get my dad back up on his feet again. I thought I'm gonna make him happy, I'm gonna make him laugh, and I wanna distract him. And I think that was where almost I always had this personality, but it was just kind of born in a different way at that point because I wanted him to laugh again, and I wanted him to be happy again, and I wanted to do whatever it took to make him be my dad again. I didn't want to see him cry. He was my father. I wanted him to be strong. So it's a hard thing to see when your father is just weak, and you know, it's just, it was just so hard to see that. But I have a lot of respect for my mother now because I realize now, as a, like, an adult-ish, that I, what my mom was, you know, sagacious enough to know that we can move on, that we can have a family, that we can, you know, there's going to be grandchildren, there's going to be marriages, there's going to be, there can be happiness again. So uh, my dad wasn't as, you know, his, he wasn't, he was short-sighted. He didn't really get it. But he's still alive. And, you know, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I don't li like him so much anymore, but I love him. Wow. Um, as, a, as a youngster, you uh, talked about how at an early age you saw you're the same person, but one day people see you one day, the next day they see you in a very different way. Can you share with us the Goldie Hawn story? Well, I think, you know, I think I just always wanted attention, clearly, and I... It was that I wanted somebody, I, wanted, I had opinions, and I felt so strongly about them, and I couldn't keep them inside. I just wanted to be heard. That's the only way I could describe it, is I wanted to be heard. I wanted to say things. I, you know, I always had a huge personality. It, it wasn't always popular. You know, it's, it's not the best quality you can have. People are never like, she's 
So, you know, it's a surprise when people meet me and say, oh, you're sweet. We didn't think that of you. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know, nobody's one thing. Nobody's one dimensional. But for me, my strongest desire was to be heard. I wanted my opinions out there. I didn't want anybody writing anything for me. I wanted to say it myself. I wanted to get my point across. And I wanted to be generous in life. And I wanted to have fun. Like, all I really ever think about is, is this going to lead to something fun? But you told that Goldie Hawn story. Instead. Oh, I lied, yes. I was in um, grade school, and I guess nobody was paying attention to me, so I made up a story that I was going to be in the next Private Benjamin sequel <laughs> and playing Goldie Hawn's daughter. And then all of a sudden, everybody at school was like, you know, following me home. Everyone wanted to be friends with me. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then my mom's like, what? <laughs> My mom's like, Goldie Hawn, what are you talking about? And I've met Goldie Hawn since then, and I told her the story. She's like, I heard about your story. <laughs> she goes, I heard about your book where you said you were going to be in my movie. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I know. I mean, and she's, I wish I was in that movie. I wish that was a movie. <laughs> so you uh, end up in uh, L.A. trying to break in, as hundreds of thousands of people do. Yeah. But uh, you... Uh, did things a little differently. Uh, when did you realize that you had the real ability to do stand-up? What, what, uh... I don't think, however far you get in any sort of career, that you really believe that you're good at it. I, like, you have moments, you've kind of got like those like ephemeral moments where you're like, that was good. When you walk on stage and there's 5,000 people at some arena and you're like, these people paid money to see me and I'm bitching about what I'm gonna eat for dinner. Like, you, you have those moments and then you, or, or you have a moment and you go, this is good, I'm good at this, I'm good at this. I never thought I was, you never think you ever fit in. You don't ever think I belong here. And when you do, it's fleeting. So I, you know, I tried stand up because I didn't know what else to do. At least that was, the only, that was the only avenue for me to say what I wanted, to bitch about what I thought was ridiculous, to talk about all the things I saw and how stupid I thought everybody was. And you know, it takes different shapes as you go through your career. And I just, I, I didn't know that I was good at it. I think I had a rough time in the beginning and I didn't do too badly because I would have cowered and I would have stopped and tried something else. But I had tried to be an actress and I was like, this is so annoying and I'm not skinny enough, you know? And I don't want to be that skinny. I like bagels, I'm a Jew. You know, I wanted to have fun. <laughs> And so I couldn't ever be that disciplined, you know? So I, I just did comedy. It was the perfect thing for me. It was the perfect avenue for me to be able to create my own career. And uh, out in LA, they wait on tables, and uh, you learned that that wasn't your vocation. I wasn't great at being a server. A waitress was the old way to say it. Um, server, I think, is more PC. And uh, no, I got fired from about eight to 10 waitressing jobs usually but because I went off on one of the customers for treating me in a way that I didn't think was respectful or not, get, you know, I don't know. I just hated people who didn't look you in the eye. <laughs> they would be like, what are the specials? It's like, who gives a shit what the specials are? It's just <laughs> lunch. Like, you're not even going to remember this meal. Are you serious? <laughs> but I was mad because I never looked at the special board, so I didn't know what the answer was. <laughs> you, you know, you get mad at other people for things you don't know. <laughs> so fa fast forward, you have Ch Chelsea lately, huge, huge success, almost six million followers on Twitter, one and a half million on Instagram, five bestsellers, including something that any of us who've written a book can only fantasize about, New York Times, one, two, three. You're occupying the three top positions. That was a great day in my life, because I called my father. And I said, Dad, guess what? And he was on speakerphone, and I, my, my makeup artist, I was at my show, my makeup artist filmed it. You'd find out on Tuesday at like 1 o'clock if you've made the list and what number you are on the New York Times list. And in this day and age, you know, the New York Times list doesn't really mean anything. But for me, it was great. So now they have like a celebrity bestseller list. Have you seen this in the New York Times? It's like, oh, God, really? I mean, this is how bad things have gotten. So. Uh, I call my dad, I go, Dad, you're never going to guess what. He goes, what is it? And I said, I'm number one, two, and three on the New York Times bestseller list. I didn't even go to college. <laughs> Can you believe it? And my dad was 
you know, crying on the phone. It was just so sweet. And it, it was one of those moments, you know, you dream about a moment. Like, I would never even have dreamt that moment, because who would think that something like that could happen? And it was one of those moments where I actually was in that moment, and I appreciated it, and I thought, this is a great day of my life. I'm so happy. I did it, you know. Because once you hit the number one spot on the New York Times list, you better hit it the next time. Because you're, otherwise, you're like, now, you know, the, the psychological maelstrom of that is just so, but it was, an, it was a beautiful moment. It was amazing. And I worked really hard on those first three books. You, uh, you also have your own uh, production company, Borderline Amazing. You've uh, had numerous, hundreds of sold out comedy shows. You're one of the few who's done what everyone in the business dreams of doing, uh, content platforms and being able to go from one to the other. How did you do it? Is it something that just happened or? Uh... I just have a severe ADD and I, I, you know, I couldn't do, I think it, my second book, Are You There, Vod, Kids Me Chelsea, came out in conjunction with my show launching. So it was the perfect kind of, you know, it was the perfect confluence of events and it blew up and it was great and it was, um, and, and then you go on tour to, you know, when I do something, I try and do it really hard or well. I try to go for it. I don't want to disappoint my publishers. I don't want to be disrespectful. I want to be the person that's known to work the hardest. And, um, and so you, I went on tour, and that tour leads, you know, then you, you do 20 cities, and then they're like, oh, you're selling out. Let's do 20 more. And I'm like, I can do it. And I would fly out Thursday night after my show and go to, you know, St. Louis, and then Minneapolis, and then Atlanta, and then come home and do, you know, my shows for the week, and then do it again. And you do book signings. I mean, I worked my ass off. I fucking worked my ass, excuse me, my ass off. Oh, it's and there's no other reason for it. It's not that I'm smarter, it's not that I'm brighter or funnier, I just worked harder than anyone I knew was working. That's the way to do it, is my... <laughs> but before, before we get to your, uh, your, 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 your new thing, uh, a couple of quick questions. Women in comedy, you're the only one who succeeded at late night. Joan Rivers tried it, didn't work out. You did it for seven years. You've broken an industry which is hard to do anyway. And uh, uh, you, are women now getting more success in comedy? Yeah, I think so. I think they're all over the place. Not because of me, because of, I think it's just, you know, it's comedy, doing a comedian is very gross. Like, you have to go on the road and stay in hotels that you would never want to stay at in a million years and spend the weekend in places like Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> or a week. You could have to stay for a week. I mean, and you're just with men everywhere, and it's just not something that women are prone to, to want to do. You don't want to live like that. Luckily, I grew up with three brothers, so I was like, this is nothing. And then, you know, when you do succeed, it's worth it. It's worth playing sold out arenas and going to, or, you know, theaters or what have you, and, and walking in and having those people. So, uh, yes, there are women that are successful. There are a plethora of women now, obviously, who are more successful than me and people who are coming up and everything. And that's the great thing is that there's room for everyone. It's not just one person, there are many. Um. In terms of uh, what you're uh, trying, first of all, entrepreneurship involves failure. You mentioned going out, audiences, especially when you're starting, they don't know who you are. I'm good They're at rejection. They, they, uh, they do that. But even when you think you're starting to move, uh, share with us, even though it may be a little painful, but I think it's uh, inspiring that you get whacked from once in a while, Montreal Comedy Festival. What? Oh, I bombed so badly. I, 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 I had these managers, and they were like, you're going to be the next big thing. You're the only pretty comic. I was like, OK. All the big wigs were there, and she. Every person that was of import in that you know, like line of business, every head of every studio network, everybody who could give me a future was in that room, and I ate it so badly. There was so much buzz around me. It was so much like, da, 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 and which is why I'm very leery of buzz. You don't do that. You know, when people are coming up, it's like, you're gonna, there's always blowback. There's always blowback. So don't ever push something so hard. And I 
I bombed. I bombed so badly. And then two days later, I showcased in LA in front of two networks that hadn't been in the room in Montreal. And I got like a $100,000 development deal for my own TV show. And it had changed in 48 hours. So everything changes in 48 hours, always. Just when you think you're at your lowest, it t turns. It's, there's never, your lowest doesn't ever last that long. It's always something. And you just have to be willing and open to say, all right, pick yourself up and do it again. And if you bomb again, then you might want to think about not being funny. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, uh, a year ago, here you have great success. You've been expressing some dissatisfaction with the, the night show. You, you thought there was something more you could do. But walking away from a multi-million dollar gig, even if it's, uh, you don't find fully fulfilling, is hard to do, but, but you did it. And now you're embarked on something where there is no guarantee of success. You're normally on late night shows, you have the desk, you have the gig, the celebrities, blah, blah, blah. You're doing something completely different. Netflix, streaming, no specific time, three times a week. Explain what you see unfolding and why you felt you had to do it even though you had huge dollars doing what you had been doing before. I looked at my life <coughs> and I thought, I'm bored. I thought, I'm not being as smart as I am. This show isn't as smart as me. I want to do a show that's smarter than me. I want to learn. I want to make my mother proud. I want to make my family proud. I want to take chances. I want to set an example. That's not the impetus completely that I want to set an example, but wholly it is. I want to, I, I want to walk away. For, I could have gotten paid $10 million a year for the next five years. That is never a reason to make a decision. I work my ass off, and I know that comes in return. If you go to the gym every day, your body's going to get better. So. I work hard, and I know it's going to get better, and things were going to, I planned on just quitting, you know, indefinitely not doing anything. I didn't want to work, and then as soon as everybody heard I was quitting, I got all these offers, and people were throwing ridiculous amounts of money at me. And I just kept hearing the voice in my head saying, don't do something for money. Don't ever fill somebody else's shoes. Don't go into that network environment where you're going to be told what to do by a man who doesn't, who thinks he's doing you a favor by giving you a job or whatever the situation, which is the feeling I got in several of the, my meetings that I took. And at the end of the day, I said to my manager, who's a little nugget named Irving Azoff, I said, I want to meet with, <coughs> I want to meet with Netflix. And he said, all right, you know, they haven't asked to meet with you. Like, I'm not in, I don't care. I don't, I, don't, I don't get hit on. I hit on people. So, <laughs> so let me go meet with Netflix. And I met with these amazing people at Netflix. They have an amazing team of really intelligent people. And I said, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And, 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 and they said, let's do it. And I thought, all right, this is something I can do. I don't want people chasing me. I want to go after an opportunity that doesn't what seem. What attracted you to Netflix? What I think you... they're progressive. I think they're smart. I think that they're, uh, you know, I didn't know them as well. I mean, I'm a fan of Netflix, but I didn't know them as well until I sat in that room. And I thought, these are people that are smarter than me. I want to always be around people that are smarter than me. And they are, until I am. <laughs> now, uh, with, 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 with Netflix, you're doing uh, four specials this year. Yeah. Share, share, share with us. What, They're called, what? one is, this is kind of like a bridge to my new show, which will debut next year, but uh, one is Chelsea Does Marriage, because I've always been fascinated by people who want to be married. <laughs> one is Chelsea Does Racism. Um, I just came from Alabama. <laughs> And the greatest quote in Alabama was like, I go, what do you think the biggest misconception about the South is? And they were like, that people just think we drink beer and eat barbecue all day as the guy's drinking a beer <laughs> and eating barbecue. And he's like, and you know, they, they think, you know, all you ever hear about is the bad things about slavery. You just never hear the good stories. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah? And, um, I mean, amazing in this country that that exists because you have certain you have certain notions that that's like the South, but you don't believe it until I was deep in the South, like very deep, and I was like, oh, I mean, National Donut Day was a big deal down there. <laughs> so that's that's the second one. So it's Chelsea does marriage. Chelsea does ra these are the titles. Chelsea does marriage. Chelsea does racism. Chelsea does Silicon Valley because I'm very fascinated by that, and I can't use my phone and. Chelsea does ayahuasca, which is uh, that hallucinogenic drug you do in uh, Peru with a shaman, and I'm going to go down there and do that on camera, among uh, many other drugs I'm going to do on camera with a, 
medically supervised because people don't realize, you know, I've taken an Ambien and drank in, or drank in, oh God, I'm on Ambien right now. I've, um, I take Ambien during interviews. No, I take, you know, taking an Ambien when you've had a glass of wine, taking a Lunesta, taking a sleeping pill or a Xanax or, you know, doing acid or mushrooms, all of that stuff I'm doing with a medical doctor just to show what happens in your brain when you're doing these things and how irresponsible some are and, you know, how, like, some are just real fun. <laughs> now, you've uh, described the show you're going to be doing with Netflix next year as a, sort of a fun 60 minutes or a cool 60 minutes. I call minutes. it a 30 minutes. I don't know if that will be the title. That's a working title. I want something hipper. I love 60 minutes. I love Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. I love Vice. I like, I, there are elements of those shows that I feel like could be, fr I want a fresh, fast-paced, cool show that's informative, that's educational, that can be fun. Tonally, that's me, but a different beast than what I've done. And, you know, this is the second part of my career as far as I'm concerned, and there'll be a third probably, you know. Um, but I, I just, you know, I want it, I love 60 Minutes. I just wish they would just hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Now, on, uh, when, when uh, you talked about leaving something that you didn't enjoy anymore, even if it seemingly was uh, costly, one of the things that const constrain people is their constituency, the base they've developed. You've had a huge audience, especially 18 to 34. Do you worry, can you bring them over to this new kind of show? Or are you developing, and you're going to be developing a new audience? What, what goes through your mind when you say, how, how do I keep the, what's there and build on that, or am I going to lose some to build the new? Maybe. I'll probably lose some, and I'll probably gain some people that never liked me before, and maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think you can base your decisions on um, making everybody happy. I think I have to be interested in what I'm doing in order for my audience to be interested in what I'm doing. I think if I'm bored as a host, they're bored. And, uh, you know, I may very well lose a lot of people, and I may very well gain a lot of people, and I hope I do. I hope that I can broaden everything I've done. I, I have something to say. I'm responsible. Like, I'm a good girl. I try every day to do the right thing, and I, and I do. I don't do st bad stuff when no one's looking unless, you know, it's like a cigarette or something. I don't do that. <laughs> I, I, and I pride myself on that, and I know I can. I know that I can get a great message across. I love when I can make somebody laugh. I love when I can go up to a stranger and pinch his cheek, and because he looks sad. You know, it's those little moments in your life that you can make a difference in somebody's day. My mom always used to say, you know, if you see somebody sad, go up and give them a hug. It doesn't matter if you don't know them. My dad's like, well, don't hug everybody. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> be discernible. But. It's true. What my mom said is true. You can change somebody's day. And by doing that, you can change maybe their week or maybe their month or maybe their attitude. And finally, how do you manage the empire you've created? Uh, so often people do something and they lose control of it. How do you, you said you're, when it comes to business, you can be ruthless. How, how do you make sure that you can do what you want to do, not uh, get upended by the backup, the logistics, and the companies that you've created? You know, I've had a lot of breakups in my professional life. One recently, I, I had partners for several years, and we broke up when this happened. I changed my thing, and, and that was hard, but the right thing. And I think the thing that people get caught up on a lot of times is when somebody's leaving or somebody wants to leave, and you take it personally, and you don't want them to leave you, or they have an opportunity that's better suited for them, and you think, oh, God, I'm going to lose this person. I'm going to... It's always the right thing. You always can, you don't look back. You always move forward. There's always new people to meet. I meet new people all the time that inspire me. I, you know, I, you listen and you hear new ideas and you find people that, that say things to you that you haven't heard before. And that's just the way to do it for me. I would never tell, I, I just think don't ever get sidelined by people that don't want to go down that road with you. You know, don't depend on other people. Just depend on your vision and your authenticity and, and, and go out there and do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Don't ever let anyone tell you that your ideas are wrong. And then you fire them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I should pro probably end it there, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what was the best career advice you ever got? Uh, I think it was a book I read, Chris Matthews, you know that book, I mean, he's ridiculous, but he, <laughs> he wrote a book saying, like, there are so many people that will say no, I won't, this is paraphrasing, there are so many people that will say no to you, so many people that say no to you, 
and there is all, all you need is one person to say, yeah, I think you're special. I think you're, uh, you can succeed at what you're trying to do. And that's all you need is one person. Chelsea, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.